Grace is such a, I guess, a frustrating topic in some ways for some people, and it really shouldn't be. But there has been a lot of different doctrines that have been brought forth because of grace. You have the idea of once saved, always saved. You know that we we can't fall from grace. We have no problem. We have no worry. There's nothing in the world that can keep us. There's also the idea that well, what is grace? I don't even know what grace is. How can I know you know the grace of God and by grace you're saved through faith? How does all this work? And so grace has a lot of questions attached to it. Yeah, I would agree. (laughs) What would you do if someone asks, how does the Bible characterize grace? I think one of the um, first passages I would go to is Ephesians chapter Mm 2. And, of course, verse 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. You just mentioned that. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So it's characterized as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a work of God, the grace of God. It's His gift. It's, it's an unmerited gift. It's an unmerited favor toward, some, to, toward mankind. But I'd like to back back up to verse 4. In Ephesians 2, verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us or made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then verse 7, he says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Now keep that phrase in mind. In his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. Verse 7 is key because... He says, all of this is through Christ Jesus. Well, what is it? He, he wants to show mankind, he wants to show all the world the riches of his grace. And I've heard it explained like this before. You know, you, you've got a, a treasure chest, if you will. You open it up and you're expecting to see the riches. You're expecting to see the treasure that's in it. And if you open that up and that represents the grace of God, what are you going to see in it? Well, he says in verse 4, God who is rich in mercy. Mm-hmm. He's, he's not going to, he's, he's going to show mercy upon me, not what I deserve, but he's going to offer mercy. And for his great love, he characterizes it as great love. It is, you know, it, it's like John 3, 16, you know, sure. God so loved the world. His great love wherewith he loved us. And then you come back to verse 7 again, and he says the, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness. You open up that treasure chest of grace, and what you ultimately see is mercy, love, and kindness of God that is shown to mankind. We don't deserve that. We sinned against him, and yet he still sent his only begotten son to die for us. That, right. That's how the Bible characterizes grace, but that's not the only place that it characterizes grace. In Titus chapter 2, he characterizes grace uh, again. The Apostle Paul does. We come to Titus chapter 2, and for the the grace of God, verse 11, that uh, bringeth salvation. So we know what it does. It brings salvation. Hath appeared to all man, all men, that's all mankind, teaching us, the American Standard 1901 says, it instructs us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Here, Paul characterizes the grace of God as that which brings forth salvation. But at the very same time, and and that's what he would talk about in Ephesians chapter Mm 2. He did it by his love. He showed mercy unto mankind. He showed kindness to mankind. For by grace you save through faith. And that, literally in that passage, is the system of faith. That's not one's personal faith. That's the system of faith, the gospel system of faith. And the grace of God that brings salvation, he says, appeared to all mankind. But notice what else it does. It teaches... It instructs us how to live. Now, the, the, world, the, world's con- the religious world's concept of grace has nothing to do with teaching mm-hmm. or instructing. And yet, that's exactly what Paul says the grace of God does. And so you get a picture here that he's talking about the very gospel, that gospel system of faith. It instructs us. It tells us how to deny certain things and how to live as a godly person. 
Why? So that we can look forward to heaven, so that we can see the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's, that's how it's characterized, that unmerited favor. Right, you talk about the unmerited favor. I remember being a boy, it was 13 years ago now, so I was around 12 years old, and my dad, we, we had done something as children that had gotten <laughs> us into trouble, and so we had gotten grounded. And my dad called us down into the living room, and he asked me first, he said, Michael, what is grace? I didn't know. I, I, um, I don't know, Dad. And he said, it's unmerited favor. And so this afternoon when we go to the movies, I want you to know that you're being given grace. You children have been given grace for what you did. You don't deserve it. You deserve to be punished. But instead, I'm going to show you unmerited favor, something you do not deserve but get anyway. Okay. Thirteen years later, fresh in my mind. I remember where I was sitting, okay? Yeah. And that is a lesson that has always stuck with me. And it really, even though I didn't get it then, the preacher in me now, that is so helpful right. and so beneficial because now I have an understanding better. So wait a minute. God commendeth His love toward us that while I was yet worthy, mm -hmm. while I was yet deserving, while I was yet a sinner, right. while I was yet in the worst part of my entire life, God said, you know what, I want you to get something that you don't deserve, that you don't even, you, you shouldn't get, but I'm going to give you anyway. We, we've done gospel meetings before, and, and this has probably happened to you, I'm sure. You ever had an old lady come up to you after you preach and she gives you money? <laughs> and, and, you know, she's maybe not supposed to, and, and she, she doesn't need to do it, but she does it anyway. What did you really do to deserve that? You just preached the truth. But she gave you a gift anyway. She gave you something that benefits you. That you didn't sit there and you didn't do a, a, you know, an incredible service for her. And the church is probably going to pay you anyway. But she said, mm -hmm. I want you to have this. That's, that's unmerited favor. Right. That's something that you don't deserve, but you get anyway. That's the exact same thing my dad did for me. Now, when I study it from a biblical perspective, not just me being a sinner in the New Testament, but I've got to go back to the book of Judges. Right. I've got to look in that time because if you don't see a picture of grace there, I don't know if you, if you ever will because if you're, you call it the sin cycle of Judges perhaps. You have Israel serving the Lord. They fall into sin and idolatry. They're enslaved. They cry out to God. God raises up a judge. They are delivered. They serve the Lord. They fall into idolatry. That's the whole book. It just continues over and over again. And yet every time they call out for it, God gives it to them. Every time they ask for the Lord to bless them, God gives it to them. Right. But then I'm reminded of one of the most absolutely horrendous examples that God ever gives to the children of Israel. And it's in Ezekiel 16. God likens them to spiritual idolatry. That God took them, spiritually speaking, married them, made them His wife, and then they went out and cheated on Him. Mm -hmm. That's the entire, you know, crux and the entire gist of chapter 16 of Ezekiel and 23 even. That God had done everything for them and they went out and cheated on Him. They went out and abused the good things that He had done for them. So what He says in this chapter is all of the horrible things that they've done, but I love verse 60. He says in, the, in this verse, Nevertheless, despite all of this, I will remember my covenant with you. Right. Wait a minute. You just, you just likened us to a spiritual adulterer. How many of us, how many of us have the grace and the love to forgive our spouse if they cheated on us? My wife has often said, joking around, if we're watching a TV show where they say, she, I'm leaving you in a heartbeat. I'm not even going to sit there and wait for an explanation. She's right to say that. Right. Because what would I, I have broken the trust that I have told her I would give her for the rest of her life. God would have been right to have said, you know what? I'm done. In the time of Hosea, or Hosea, depending on how you say it, right? God told him, you go take a wife of whoredom. And I want you to realize what I've gone through. Whoa. And yet God is still going to say in Ezekiel 16 and in the tail end of the major or minor prophets, I will leave a remnant. Yeah. That's grace. When you study the Old Testament, 
even in the time of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness trying to get to the promised land, God was so gracious to them because He didn't need to be. He didn't have to be. It's better that we go back to Egypt. Really? Fine. Go back. Right. What, what did I do for you except get you out of bondage and, and you know, provide quail and manna and provide you a, 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 you know, a trail guide and all of these things that you need? No, I, I've done nothing. <laughs> You know, we, we have the phrase, what am I, chopped liver? You know, right. you've probably heard it's really outdated now, but that's the type of mentality there that God's showing us. What do you, what do you mean I've done nothing for you? Right. That you had it better in Egypt when you were enslaved and beaten and, and mistreated? Now you're free and you're wandering and you're going toward a promised land, and yet you think you have it worse than you had it back in Egypt? We talk about graduation goggles. I don't know if you know this term or not, but it's right before graduation in high school or college. The four years that have been so horrible and awful, all of a sudden they look pretty great, <laughs> and you don't want to go, right? Because <laughs> you, you don't like the uncharted waters that you're going into. That's what I think they were doing. Mm -hmm. They didn't like the uncharted territory they were going in. They didn't like that it wasn't instant. We like instant gratification, even in the time of this. They wanted instant gratification. We're thirsty. Give us water now, like they got it that quick when they were in Egypt. Right. Like they got the food that quick when they were in Egypt. But because they're in uncharted territory, they were sitting there and it almost comes across as, because we don't know this, we're going to determine that we don't like it. And God could have struck them dead. God could have done that multiple times through the Old Testament. And yet, Ezekiel 16, 60, I will remember my covenant with you. That gives me chills. Yeah. To, to remind me, after reading this scathing review, where he literally says at one point in this chapter, you couldn't be satisfied. You took so many adulterous lovers, spiritually speaking, that you couldn't be satisfied. I couldn't imagine having a spouse cheat on you once, but multiple times, and God still says, I will remember my covenant with you. That is the best picture of grace that I see Absolutely. in the Old Testament. And it continues into the New Testament where God says, I'm going to give you salvation, Titus 2.11. Yeah. But then that gives me the next part that we want to talk about. What would you do if someone asks, well, then what does the grace of God cover? Well, it certainly covers sin. But, right. But part of the problem that we've, I guess, seen uh, that's confusing about grace in the world today is that some have run so far with that idea. Right. And, and, and Paul, uh, you know, saw that coming. And Romans 6 and verse 1, he says, well, what should we say then? Shall we continue in sin? If, if Paul, if you're saying that uh, because of all of our sin, then, then God has been gracious to us. He has, uh, he has given us His His grace. So, we should sin more, right? And 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 then we don't have to worry. No, Paul says absolutely not. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. He says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We're supposed to run far away from it. We've been forgiven. We've been shown that mercy. Yeah, we should have lost our lives. We 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 have. Uh, we should have been punished for this, but we, we were not. We were given grace instead. And we should realize that and run far in the other direction uh, away from sin. And, and so he says, because he's been freed from sin, verse 7. He that is dead is freed from sin. And so he's, he's at his sin washed away. And, and so the grace of God simply covers sin, but it's not a license to sin. And, and so, you know, we have to be careful of, of either extreme uh, on that. And, and I would add one more passage uh, to this thought as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 uh, begins, well, it, actually it ends uh, with this conversation about be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. So this is that conversation about being yoked to the world. Well, as a child of God, you can't be yoked to the world. You can't be yoked to sin. You've got to stay far away from that. In fact, he would go on to say, well, God's promised, I will dwell with them and, and walk with them and be their God. They shall be my people. So come out from among them. Be separate. Be clean. And, and touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you. I'll be a father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. What a beautiful thought. Mm -hmm. And he, here he is saying, you know, there, there's sin out there in the world. Stay far away from it. I want you to be my sons and my daughters. I love you. I'm your father. And so having, so verse 1 of the next chapter, he says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now keep that in mind. And, and go back and look how he began the chapter, verse 1 of chapter 6. 
We then, as workers together with him, beseech you, we beg you, that you receive not the grace of God in vain. There's the possibility that I can receive God's grace, His graciousness, in vain. How so? Well, if I yoke myself once again with the world. If I continue to, to live in sin in that way. So much the same as Romans 6 covers, he covers it here again in 2 Corinthians 6. And, and so we, we have this, well, what does the grace of God cover? It covers sin, but it's not an umbrella to, to cover one who would continue in sin. So. Absolutely. I think about, you, you touched on the fact that it's not a license to sin, though mm -hmm. that is definitely what a lot of the people in the world would want it to be considered mm -hmm. true. to be. Well, yeah, like you said, well, why don't we just keep sinning, Paul? I mean, we, <laughs> right. if, if we're going to be blessed. If, there's you know, more grace. You remember the, the, the book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie, right. he's right. going to want a glass of milk. <laughs> right. And this goes on and on throughout the book, and it, it basically talks, and it comes all the way full circle where he says, so he'll ask you for a cookie. Right. And the book ends with saying, and if you give him a cookie, he'll want a glass of milk. Right. The main purpose of that book, the main point the book is making is, if you give an inch, boy, they're going to take it a mile. Right. And Paul's saying there, I am not saying that. The Spirit is not saying that. Yeah. We need to take what we've been given and be gracious for it. Yeah. We need to sit there and say, we didn't deserve it. We got it anyway. What a wonderful blessing that is yeah. that I can sit there and say, I didn't deserve it, but I got it. Wow. You know, you, you have this mindset of you give somebody a free dinner. You know, maybe you and I go out to eat and you say, hey, I got your, I got your meal this time. Wow, thanks. Okay. My expectation, though, shouldn't be the next time we go out to eat that you're going to just pay for me from now on, <laughs> right? Right. That's a, I didn't deserve right. you to pay for my dinner, <laughs> right? But you did that one time, though I didn't deserve it. <clears throat> my expectation then from that point on is that was a gift that you gave me. I need to be thankful for it, and I need to move on. And I don't need to sit there and wait for the next handout. Right. That's what it comes across in the book of Romans is, well, let's just wait for God to give another handout. Mm -hmm. That's not what God's about. God is saying, I've done it already. Yeah. Now you got to accept it. But I think a great picture of what the grace of God covers is in Paul himself. Paul is, we have a tendency as human beings, we repent and we know we're forgiven pretty much. We, we believe that. But we don't have the ability to forget what we've done. Mm -hmm. And so we still remember it. Paul still remembered it. Yeah. And Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in about verse 8, Last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Notice how he words himself here. I am the least of the apostles. I, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, like you just talked yeah. about. It was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. How am I where I am today? God's grace. Paul, where were you before you became a Christian? Man, I was a persecutor of the church. I was an individual that said, I don't think the church needs to be around. I, th I saw it as a threat, yeah. not as a blessing. And so I was determined. Acts 8, Acts 9, I am breathing threats. I'm throwing people into prison. But I'm blinded on the road to Damascus, and I'm told, go to the city, and you'll be told what you must do. God's grace made me the apostle that I am today, is right. Paul's mentality. It is nothing of my own. I love how he closes the book of Galatians, where he even says in chapter 6 um, that he doesn't boast. In verse 14, God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. In Jesus Christ, neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. He's talking about the difference there. It doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It doesn't make you a better Christian. It doesn't make you a better individual. And yet people were going around acting as if it did. And Paul said, I can't boast in anything because the grace of God and the grace of the sacrifice of Jesus is the only thing that I can sit there and boast in that I was counted blessed mm -hmm. to be given such a gift. Not worthy, blessed to be given it. I didn't deserve it. I got it anyway. That's the blessing. This is not like when we yeah. do a tax refund <laughs> where you sit there and say, hey, you paid too much. We're going to give you a refund. Mm -mm. This is a, ima imagine you do your taxes this year coming up and the person says, you've got a $25,000, you know, amount coming to you. And you say, well, 
Did we pay that? No, it's just what the government's going to give you. Why? Well, they just decided to do that this year. They're going to give people some money back. You know, they don't deserve it, but they're doing it anyway. That would be a shock. No doubt. <laughs> and you, you couldn't sit there and on paper justify it by saying, well, I paid $25,000 more in taxes. I can justify it and, you know, at a tax return, hey, I got a three grand or a grand back or whatever. I paid that much extra. Mm -hmm. Makes sense that I'm getting it back. Can't say that about the, the sacrifice of Jesus. I can't say, well, I was so holy that Jesus had to come to this earth and right. die for me to pay me back. I can't, pay for, I can't pay for the gift that was given to me. But I think this comes back to a final part of this that you mentioned, you kind of touched on. Some people have taken this as far as saying, hey, you know what? We don't have to worry about our salvation then. Because the grace of God, it covers a multitude of sins. Well, then wouldn't it stand to reason that it will cover the multitude of sins we commit after we are saved? Isn't that what the grace of God does? So what would you do if someone asks, or someone says, actually, I know I can't fall from grace? Uh, I think it's interesting. James opens up. Uh, I know we'll go to Galatians 5, 4, and I'll let you cover that in just, sure. a, mo uh, uh, just a moment. But in James chapter 1, you know, he's, he's talking about the trials that we go through and count it all joy. And he, if you lack wisdom, you should ask, and God will give it so that you have an understanding of what you've gone through. And then he gets down to verse 12, blessed is the man that endureth. He, he goes through it, and he endures temptation. And when he's tried, he, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised him to them that love him. And let no man say that he's tempted, or when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Do not err. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this was a, a false idea that was out there. So do not err, my beloved brethren. And, and, and then he talks about every good and every perfect gift. That, and I, I think they're in, he's talking about salvation. He's talking about the blessings of the man that endures through the temptation. And, and James is writing to Christians. He's not writing this to the rest of the world to say that, hey, anybody has this. No, he's writing to Christians and he's encouraging them uh, in their faithfulness unto God. There's a very real possibility then that, that they could err in this, verse 16, that, that they're not going to endure the temptation, mm -hmm. that, that they could fall away. And so then I think about 2 Peter and both first and second Peter, you know, there's there's a writing of remembrance to stir up their remembrance. There's a writing to encourage them. The, those that are scat they're scattered as well. So James and Peter are both writing to the Christians that are scattered about. These are general letters to Christians. And in and in second Peter, he begins uh, the chapter talking about that uh, grace and peace as he begins his normal thing. He says that through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that knowledge or something about that knowledge, that's a different type of knowledge. That's, that's epinosis. That's, that's a high knowledge. That's mm -hmm. a divine knowledge that he's given. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge. That's epinosis again, that high knowledge, divine knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world. And why would he have to spend so much time encouraging them in their faithfulness if they couldn't fall? Mm -hmm. and, and then he goes on, besides this, give all diligence, add to your faith. How does that faith come? It comes from the divine knowledge. That, that, this is the Bible that he's talking mm -hmm. about. That which was given to the apostles and New Testament writers. And besides, the, give all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and, and charity. And if these things be in you and abound, if, conditional, if they're in, a, in you and abound, they make you that you're neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He's writing to Christians, they've been purged from their old sins. You could forget that and, and you could lose out. And so he says, give diligence, brethren, verse 10, to make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, if you do what? If you take the faith that you have because of the, divine, because of the Bible, 
Holy Word of God. He's given unto us this. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That produces faith, Romans 10, 17. If you have that faith and you add to that faith, you continue to grow and you continue to walk in the light, as John would say, then you're not going to fall. But the very real implication is, but if you don't, mm -hmm. you will. You will. Now, he doesn't have to say that, right. but the implication is there. So if, if and he, twice he says, be diligent in this, you could lose your salvation. You could have it and lose it. You can fall from grace. And I'll let you cover Galatians 5. Now, here's what's interesting to me. We understand, you know, like a, a recipe for a cake or a recipe for any dish. If someone wants to say, and I've heard this said before, well, if you do these things, those these things are if, if you, you know, continue to make your call and election sure in the sense of those are the things, not continuing and all the other stuff. <laughs> okay, leave out eggs right. next time you make a cake. Leave right. out the milk or the flour or whatever it is that you're baking. Leave that out. See how well it tastes. My grandmother years ago on my mother's side, my mom's mother, made a sugar cream pie and accidentally used too much salt. She didn't use sugar, she used salt. Wow. That didn't taste good. I wasn't alive sure. back then or <laughs> old enough to have any of the pie, but that story in our family is legendary yeah. because it is literally this mindset of she didn't use the right ingredients, therefore the dish didn't taste as it is intended to, to taste. Right. Take that logic then. There is a spiritual recipe for salvation. There is the hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized, but then there's a very real one that is talked about, warned about, Acts 20, mm -hmm. Revelation 2, you stay faithful. Right. That part of the recipe can't just be skipped. What good is yeah. a cake if you don't <laughs> bake it? Right. What, what, good is, what good is a pizza if you don't put it in the oven? You, you, know, you, you make all the ingredients, but then you don't put it in the oven and cook it. You got just dough, sauce, and cheese. It's not a pizza right now. Right. You've got the makings of it, but I want to talk about Galatians 5, 4, and 7 real quick. You've become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you've fallen from grace. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? You had an opportunity. Yeah. This is not about whether your works are going to be burned up. No, the works there in 1 Corinthians 3, that's the church. Paul would say, aren't you my work, church right. at Corinth? Yep. 1 Corinthians 9, 1, aren't you my work in the Lord? Sometimes a preacher can do all that he can do, but like Ezekiel 3, the watchman warns, but no one listens. Paul says to the churches at Galatia, you fell. Right. So wait a minute, is Paul lying? There's only two options here. Either Paul was confused, which means the spirit was confused. Right. He lied, which means that it doesn't matter anyway. Or there's that third option that they don't want to talk about. It's possible to fall from grace. Right. We've got to remember that. It is possible to fall. It is possible to sit there one day and be faithful and the next day not to be. I know about it. We all do. I've had conversations with people before about the Bible, and they're no longer faithful. We've got to always keep ourselves pure and ready to go to heaven. Absolutely. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life He gives. I know, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives.